No one is that powerful, that influential, or that rich when it comes right down to it. You might say our guest today on Vista TV Denver's Movers and Shakers wrote the book. These are the people who shake up the town of Denver. These are Vista's Movers and Shakers. Welcome, Steve Barber. Stephanie, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I don't think you need an introduction, but for somebody who is new to town, let me just go ahead and reiterate what everybody else in the city already knows, that um, you're no stranger to clearing long odds and beating the tough guys down, but you faced something that was life and death. You uh, made it on the cover of 5280 Magazine as the most powerful man in the city who runs Denver. You are a philanthropist, an attorney. I think last count you have 300 attorneys working for you. You're a father, a husband, a grandfather. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. But in a blink of an eye, that was almost all wiped away from you. I'm not sure it would have been wiped away, and this kind of brings you to reality. But you were faced with death. I mean, I, I know I you, and as you attorneys like to say, full disclosure, your wife, who's always been so gracious and loving to me, I just think the world of her, and you have always been good friends to me. I knew that you were sick, and when I saw you, you didn't look very well, but you put on a strong face, and you said, oh, I'm great, I'm great. I did not understand how absolutely sick you were until I read this book. Well, let me give you a little background, if I may. I had a kidney disease when I was 18 months old, and it was a miracle that I survived it, actually. I was at the Mayo Clinic. My mother had taken me there. And after a couple of months' stay, they sent a letter back to Children's Hospital in Denver saying there's very little hope for this little boy, little boy Farber. Uh, but we know of one treatment that worked. And we put a baby in a measles ward. The baby got the measles, and it kicked the kidneys into functioning. My kidneys weren't functioning at all. And I had strep throat that went untreated. And in those days, uh, who knows what treatment they would have given anyway. Uh, Children's Hospital said, let's try that one test. So they put me in the measles ward, an 18-month-old baby. This is in 1946, right? This is in 46. My mother dropped me off. I'll tell that story in a second. And uh, said, take care of my little baby. Uh, three weeks later, I ended up getting the measles. I swallowed food that the kids with the measles chewed. And all of a sudden, my kidneys started functioning again. I heard this story all my life uh, from my mother saying, there was a reason God let you live. And you better figure it out, and you better make this world a better place. Have you figured it out? No, I'm still kind of uh, thinking of things that I should be doing. Um, interesting enough about eight years ago, before I found out I needed a transplant, I got a call from a nurse. And she said, are you the Farber baby that was in Children's Hospital 1940s, early 40s? And I said, maybe so, who's calling? And she said, well, if you were that baby, I was your nurse. Would you sit down with me? And I said, I'd be happy to. So I took her to dinner with her daughter and heard the story of a 19-year-old lady with her little baby, that was my mom, taking me and saying, they tell me he's going to die in a week or two, do everything you can. And she adopted you, right? I mean, this, yeah. was, this was her dream child, and now she was faced with losing you again. I mean, not, you know, she finally had this baby. Well, all my life I knew that at some time my kidney problem would come back. It just, when I tried to get insurance as a lawyer just to starting out, they said, no, you're not a good candidate for life insurance. Uh, when we do your actu actuarial, uh, you maybe have 10, 15 years to go. But this let me get this right. But it did work. The experiment at the Denver Children's Hospital worked in 1946. Absolutely. And you were a robust young boy, played on sports. I did. Oh, I had a very right. normal upbringing. 
I played athletics in high school and college. Uh, never even thought about it until I started going through these tests as a lawyer trying to get insurance. And they said, you know, the way we look at it, with that disease, you're going to have a very short life. The insurance people tell, told me that. The doctors didn't tell me that. But when I went in for And you physical, felt fine? I felt fine. Okay. Um, I, I didn't feel bad at all. I went for a physical when I was turning 60. The doctor said, is something bothering you? I said, nothing at all. After the test, he came in and he said, we got some real problems. Your kidneys have basically, they're uh, below 25% function. And I said, so what does that mean? And he says, either you're going on dialysis or you're going to get a transplant or both. And it really was a rude awakening, although I kind of, you know, it was, I had deep thoughts that someday that would come back. You kind of forget about it. It 58 years had passed, and I hadn't had any problems. And suddenly here I was faced with it. And, and really at the peak of your career, your family life, I mean, everything, you, you were, as they say, you know, running the city. Well, I don't know, if, you know, don't believe what you read all the time. But I was quite involved. Uh, when I got out of law school, I came down to Denver where I grew up, of course from the other side of the tracks. And uh, I went to the mayor at that time, McNichols, and said, we need to move this city forward. It's a great city, but it's a very lazy city. People refer to it as a cow town. And the older folks said to me, leave well enough alone, it's a good city. And some of us young, aggressive people we dreamt of what would be a good city. It's like Federico Pena, when he was elected mayor, he was elected on the theory of dream, of dream a great city. And he had it right. We wanted to spend more money on the arts. Today we have the second largest performing arts center in the United States. We wanted new stadiums. And all these things I seem to have found my way involved in. Well, why um, do you suppose that is? Because people knew that I liked making things happen. I wasn't a spectator, I was a participant. And just because I thought some of these things were great for Denver didn't necessarily mean others did. Uh, we, you know, uh, passed certain taxes, sales tax, that would build a football stadium, a baseball stadium. Uh, who knows what's next? But if you think about it, you almost had the Midas touch. People knew that if they called you, that they would see something happen. And, and, I, and I think I say this because sitting across from you today is really an answer to countless prayers because your Midas touch didn't work for you personally. I, I knew how the story was going to end when I read your book, but I, I still had a knot in my stomach the whole time. Not only for you, but for your wife, for your kids, for everybody that was involved. I mean, you couldn't find your way out of this as easily as you could build a stadium or open the art centers or do all the things that you seem to just wave your magic wand and you make sound, happen. You, Stephanie, you sound just like my wife. She said for 30 years, 30 plus years, you've got things done for everybody else and you can't seem to get them done for yourself. When that it had to, to be so frustrating for you. Well, it was, but of course I knew in talking to a lot of doctors, there were avenues, there were options available. It was a question of finding out how to take advantage of them. I had some good friends call the hospital and said, how can he move up the list? It's three and a half years. It's and not then, about money, those lists, right? Um, and, and, it, and it's a good thing that it's not. There's a lot of integrity. As he said to me, Steve, your friends came to see me, and there's nothing I can do, but I'd like to sit down and talk to you. So the doctor and I sat down and had lunch together, and he said, if I could do it for you, I'd do it in a second. And I said, you know, the interesting thing, you didn't see me or hear me calling you asking for it because I wouldn't do that. Is that why you put an, um, Ernesto and Sandra in the book? Well, there were a lot of reasons. We had an interesting connection. I mean, they were doing the landscaping for a good friend of mine, Jim Sullivan. Mm -hmm. um, all of a sudden, here I am in the room next to them. We're getting all these flowers and fruit baskets. and You, walk you said by you room. felt like you were in a florist. Yeah, I did. And I said, why don't you give them to Ernesto? And here was Ernesto saving his sister's life by donating a kidney to her. 
uh, early, early on in their life, they escaped the South American country, got to Denver, Colorado. Their parents were uh, murdered in front of their eyes. So here he was, he saved his sister in that journey, he saved her again. And I think part of that was the motivation of doing a book. It wasn't just a book about me and my family. It was a book of contrasting. At one time they wanted to name it the uh, peasant and the power broker. I was the peasant, of course. Um, and I felt that's not the right name. But it's, it shows you in our system that whether you have power, some perceived wealth, versus somebody who doesn't have power or perceived wealth, you're both measured the same. But you're going to be on the list the same, and your time's going to come up at the same time. I think what, what struck me when I was reading it is that here appeared to be two families that really did appear to have nothing in common with, with each other or the system, but had more in common than you ever realized because in the end it all came down to one thing, life or sure. death. And both of us had to look to our families to have life. Uh, I didn't go on dialysis. Sandra was on dialysis and actually was weakening while she was on dialysis. I just, you know, and not that dialysis is a bad thing, but I talked to people that were on dialysis and they were in a very weakened state. When they weren't on it, they were extremely weakened. When they were on it, they were just laying there five hours a day, three days a week. That wasn't me. So I, you know, I kind of sat down with friends. I sat down with clergy. Everybody says, are you spiritually okay where you're at? And I really was when I took inventory of 60 years of my life. I had three great sons. I had a wonderful wife. I had a great family. I had reasonable success as an attorney. And, Understatement. Well, but whatever. But I, I felt that, you know, it was a, it was a life worth living. And if, if my maker said this is it, I was willing to accept it. There wasn't much choice that I had. But I continued to go to other hospitals uh, just to see if there were other opinions, other things to do. And I found there was a doctor in Turkey that was doing transplants. And I pursued, I talked to the doctor, he told me, send $100,000, send your records, no problem. I'll get you a kidney and you'll have the surgery here in Turkey. And there was a movie, you're probably too young to remember it, but it was called Midnight Express. And it was about a young man who gets busted and arrested in Turkey for smuggling certain drugs. Ends up in Turkish prison. By the way, it's a true story. And I, w I saw that movie and I sat there. I'd wake up in the middle of the night saying, I'm going to end up being the person that's going to get arrested and put in a Turkish prison. By the way, three years after my transplant, I got a phone call in the middle of the night. The doctor was arrested in Turkey, and the patients that were in his clinic were put in jail. Exactly what I kind of had a premonition about. Well, Thank those God it instincts me. got you pretty far for a reason. Now, your family tested out to be donors. Well, I took my three sons to Vegas, good place to get away, and I said, look, guys, I have some problems. I'm going to need a kidney, or I'm going to go on dialysis, or both. I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet, but I want you three to know about it. I haven't told anybody, including your mother. And, you know, take care of your mom if I don't make it. Now, why did you make that decision, that you wouldn't share that with her? Just the way she handles health issues, the way she handles Because it you with, said with she her lost mother. her mom, and it She's was devastating her, to her. It was. As it would be to anyone. Still yeah. is. So they kind of looked and they said, come on, Dad, we'll beat it. And I said, well, I'm going to do my best to beat it because I don't give up very easily, as you guys know. But we'll talk about it and let's have a good time. We had a great time in Vegas. Got back about three weeks later, my older son calls and he said, guess what? And I said, what's that? He said, I went and got checked and I'm a perfect match. They do it by antigens, first blood, and then they do it by six antigens. His six antigens were identical to mine. Did you take a giant sigh of relief or what Not was that emotion? Not really, because it, it created further complications. That's, do you want to put your sons or daughters or whatever you have, you know, into that kind of risky situation? So your first reaction was not, oh, thank God. It was, I got to look elsewhere? I mean, what was it? It was keep looking. Okay. And I had calls from people. I mean, you get amazed. 
um, good friends of mine. I use it in the book. Hank Brown, former U.S. Senator from Colorado and President of the University of Colorado, was a pledge father of mine in a fraternity when we started school. And he called and he said, by the way, I'll be your donor. And he went to the doctor and the doctor said to him, he called me and he said, the doctor thinks I'm too old. If you have a chance to get a kidney, why get an old kidney like Hank's? He was four years older than me. Find a young one. It'll give you more life. Did it just keep going right back to Greg? Every time, you know, you take a step forward, I still had turkey kind of in the bag. It bothered me going to Turkey. Not only what could happen to me, what could happen to my family. Um, it seemed shady. It seemed shady. The ethics, the morals of buying a kidney from somebody you didn't know on the street. Uh, there were a lot of risks involved. And there were a lot of. But you could die. You could die. You could die, having the transplant in Turkey. No, no, I'm saying if you if you didn't go to Turkey, right. I mean you could die. Yeah. You, you know, I mean. You know, it was interesting. There was a doctor that I knew that I ran into at a restaurant on the way home from work one night. And I was dining with some friends. My wife wasn't there. And this is the at doctor, the Blue Bonnet? It's exactly mm -hmm. Blue Bonnet. And we're sitting there, and the doctor from across the room says, have you had your transplant? And I said, no, but I'll talk to you about it some, some other time. And he came over to the table. He said, I heard your son's a perfect match. He ran a dialysis clinic, by the way, this doctor. And I said, yeah, he is. He said, do you understand what you're doing to him if you tell him no and you don't make it? Think about that impact. And I had, had you never, thought about that? Not at all. It was all about me, not about what I would be doing to my son. I had two other sons, by the way, that one was just starting law school at the time. And one was, uh, interesting enough, they all got checked and they all were matches, but not perfect matches like Greg. So but Greg just knew. He knew. He said uh, Cindy came up as a potential match. So she could have given me a kidney. As I said to George Lopez once, he was complaining about his wife buying all these auction items at a dinner. And I said, you owe her big time. That's why I went to my son rather than my wife. Uh, in some respects, Cindy, again, would be a horrible patient, would have been a horrible patient. She doesn't deal well, again, with uh, medicine and disease. And Greg kept walking in and said, I'm going to be your donor. Wow. Uh, interesting enough that... How uh, did that make you feel, that he kept saying that to you? And he was resolute about it. I was proud of my son, but it still created the issue of, why do I want to put my son under the knife? And when I asked him about it, I said, that night I went to, uh, I went home after seeing this doctor. I called him up. I said, are you still there with me? He said, look, Dad, if you ask me whether I want to go have surgery, the answer is no. If you ask me whether I want to give up an organ, the answer is no. But if you ask me whether I want to save your life, how can I say anything but yes? And I said, you're dealing with it a lot better than your old man, but I'll talk to you. And that statement that the doctor had said that night probably put us closer to having my son being my donor than anything else. Well, somebody that was experienced gave you permission. Yeah. And you needed to hear that, right? I guess I needed to hear or see a different perspective mm -hmm. than where I was coming from. Um, and I realized that I guess my life and my living was more important than the risks that uh, Greg would be taking. And I also knew that, God forbid, if he needed a kidney in the future, <clears throat> they move you up the list when you're a donor, a living donor. How long has it been since you got your kidney from It'll Greg? It'll be seven years in May. And how are you feeling since? I feel great. Immediately <clears throat> since the transplant? Uh, I started walking about a quarter of a mile a day when I got home from the hospital, just taking it easy. I, you know, I worked out every day prior to this. I worked out the day before the transplant. I played tennis twice a week. I rode a bike four miles a day. I got on the treadmill every day. So I stayed pretty active. And it was pretty easy after the surgery to say, okay, yeah, I'm going to continue to walk. And it was a couple months where I went back to the office and spent, you know, three, four hours a day. 
I would go spend, you know, an hour a day and make sure things were going well. And how'd Greg do? Initially, not well. The donor has more pain than the recipient. They, the way they do it uh, with the donor is they just make a very small incision, but they inject gas in to, to pump up the organ so it's not uh, subject to the air and tainted in that respect. And how long does that last? How long did he have he to? He was in pain for about a week. Oh, okay. About a couple months later, he was playing semi-pro baseball at the time, and he went back and started playing. Uh, today, he has no problems, thank God. You know what you did with this book is you gave us all a window into, and tell me if the numbers are still this, you say that um, the waiting list for kidneys top 60,000 for the first time in 2004 and more than 75% of the 99,000 patients on the waiting list as of May 22, 2008 have kidney disease and more than 6,500, twice the number lost in the 9-11 attacks, will die each year waiting for kidneys and other yeah. organs. What can we do then, Steve? Well, first of all, information. And that's why I thought by writing, the, there was an article in the Denver Post that came out. They came and interviewed me and they did it. Uh, showed me playing tennis again and talked about some of the things in the book about what we went through. I can't tell you, I received probably a hundred emails from people saying thank you for your story. We can't tell you how much it helped us in dealing with our issues. So, is, is so that's kind of where the book came from. Uh, oh, okay. A former uh, lawyer in my office came to me who was teaching at Denver University at the time, Harlan Abrams, mm -hmm. and I called and he said, why don't we do a book? That was a great article in the Post. And I said, let me think about it. I don't want to make it too public. And uh, convinced myself into it that it was probably a wise thing to do to help people that are going through similar type things. So what's been the reaction to the book then? It's been extremely positive. I'm Again, people that are faced with not just transplants, but disease, and how families can deal with things together. Um, you know, once we finished the book and got it out, it was a huge relief. Uh, it was interesting going over everything again. My sons were interviewed, my wife was interviewed, family and friends were interviewed. And it gave everybody an opportunity to really kind of feel like they express their feelings and emotions in the, in the book itself. What's been the reaction um, from the doctors involved, the the people that you everybody's have, been very positive. Very about positive. It. What uh, did what did the boys have to say? What did Greg have to say about it? I'm not sure he's even read the book. Oh really? <laughs> what does Cindy say about it? Um, you know, she said it's out. Let's just forget about it now. Um, you know, she's a very private person, as you know. And it kind of opened us up as a family um, to the community more so than she would have appreciated. It does definitely describe in detail how you put the leading ladies in your life through it, to say the least, yeah. starting with your sweet mom and your dad. I mean, they, this well, kidney business has really been tough on everybody, hasn't it? It has. You know, when you think about the, the day of the transplant, here's my son being wheeled in the gurney going to the operating room. Here's his father being wheeled in the gurney right behind and here's Cindy standing there seeing her life kind of pass before her. Helpless. Uh, yeah, totally helpless. So when I think about what she had to face uh, in dealing with it, what she had to face in dealing with the book, um, there were some issues. But I think, you know, those does, issues are in the past. Does time heal wounds? I mean, has it? I think it, without a doubt. Uh, you know, I, I look at every day that I have, and you talk to people that have faced death as, as precious. Um, I look at my life as precious. I still work out every single day. I eat very healthy. I don't drink. I used to drink wine. I, maybe once a year I'll sit there and toast somebody and have a sip of wine. Um, I don't miss any of that. I eat very healthy, you know. I again, every day is precious. Now you set up the American Transplant Foundation to improve the system. Is it working? It is working. It's five years old. We've uh, raised significant money. We've got our message out. Uh, and what's the message? Well, there's a lot of messages. Is number one, 
why not be a donor when you die? You don't need the organs. Is it just as simple as checking it out on your driver's license? Absolutely. Is that all you do? That's all you do. And, and that's you, a done deal. And you can go to the internet. Uh, you can apply and become a living donor or uh, a donor on, on the uh, internet. And the other thing we're trying to do is in, encourage people to be living donors. People, and it's amazing the number of people that step up that write, send us notes saying, we want to be a living donor. Find us a recipient. Because and people just didn't know. But you exactly. definitely know after you read the book well, you know, what the, and you what know the that journey it, is about. It could be pretty safe. You, right. know, uh, you could walk off a curb tomorrow, God forbid, and something happened to you. And if you want to save a life, save a life. I feel that, I'll tell you, I'll share a story with you. We did a book signing in Beverly Hills. Um, Natalie Cole and Stephen Kojo, you know. He from is, Entertainment Tonight, from yeah. From Entertainment Tonight. Our friends of mine, and both of them had kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. Kojo became my friend. I was sitting in Hawaii one day, and I get a phone call from him. And he said, somebody told me to call you. I'm going to need a kidney transplant, and I'm a nervous wreck. You can imagine how he. And I said, uh, well, let's sit down and talk about it. Who's going to be your donor? And he said, well, I have a lady friend that's interested in donating the kidney. He had the kidney donation, and later it became diseased, so it was rejected. He went back, his mother of 76 years old became his donor, and he's doing great right now. So he said, I'm going to host a book signing for you. Natalie will come do it. We'll have uh, 350 people there, and you'll sell a lot of books. Well, I met a young lady there who was 20 years old, and I said, what are you doing here with all these people? And she said, I'm on dialysis. I've been on dialysis for three years. It's another eight years till I get a kidney on the list here in California. Each jurisdiction has, you know, their time constraints, depending upon how many registered donors there are. And I said, uh, do you mind if I share your story with Entertainment Tonight? They were there. She said, not at all. So during the interview, I said, I introduced her. And I said, this is why I wrote the book, is so that people will see this young lady there and say, you know, I have an opportunity to save her life. So if one person here steps up and said, I'll be your donor, she's going to have a wonderful life. Well, about an hour later after the interview, she comes over to me and tears are just pouring down her face. And I said, did I say something that upset you? She said, no, Mr. Farber. That lady over there came over to me and said she'd be my donor. And I said, I hope she's a match. And by the way, she was a match. And uh, ultimately will end up being this, this uh, young lady's donor. So to walk out of there, I didn't care about the sale of books. We saved one life. That's pretty meaningful. Absolutely. And how do you thank somebody? How do you thank the very life that you gave for giving you life back, including Cindy, because without Cindy there wouldn't be Greg. How do you ever say thank you for that gift that keeps you here doing this interview, just, inspiring other people to live? You know, I don't look for thank yous. Um, it's, it's good enough for me to see a smile on somebody's face and to know that they have a future. But how do you ever say thank you to... To my own family? Yeah, to, to Greg. And I guess and I look Cindy. at him every day. He's a, he lives in New York, by the way, so. But when he's around, um, I take the kids on vacations. We're going to go on, you know, Thanksgiving. And you just look and you, you just tell them you're proud of them. And you express your love for your kids. How, you know, you should be doing that anyway. Yeah, but we take it for granted. We do. So he turned out to be the most powerful man in your life, your yeah, son. Yeah. Um, all right, so I have a few questions before we wrap it up. These are just fun things that we do. Um, I could eat blank every day. That's an interesting question. <laughs> I mean, I eat fish every day, so that's, that's good. Okay, that's healthy. But that's kind of you know. A no, that's good. Answer to that's that. actually healthy. Okay, favorite movie. You talked about Citizen Kane. In the oh yeah, book. I mean, <laughs> Citizen Kane was always one of my favorite movies. Um, I watched it. When I was, you know, going through this whole thing, 
Um, I have a lot of old-time favorite movies. Can you name one? Oh, anything with Bogart. What annoys you about people? You know, there's not a I don't have a pet peeve about people in general. Um, I try to get to know people. We all have positive features. We all have, you know, things. But is that there one so thing positive. that you kind of wish people wouldn't do? No, no. I really do. I I try not to sit in judgment, especially nowadays. Mm. Um, if you were not an attorney in this career, what would you be doing? I'd be a basketball star. Who, who'd you play for? <laughs> oh, the Nuggets, definitely. I, I have to say You have that, to say right? that. Uh, one word that sums you up, personally or professionally? Determined. Coolest person you know in Denver? <laughs> Stephanie Riggs. <laughs> You know, I know why you said that, because you would have gotten so many people <laughs> upset. Uh, what's your favorite restaurant in Denver? There's a lot of them. Speaking of getting people Shandy upset. Shandy Hands, <laughs> Elway's, yeah, good. Capitol Grill, The Palm. And I don't even want to say this, because I might get emotional, but after you're long gone, what do you hope people will say about you? This world's a better place because he was around. You know, every time I try to do something like the Democratic National Convention, um, most of my friends are Republicans, so they were very critical of me. Um, the reason I, re I did it when asked is because I thought it would make Denver a better city, and I believe it has done that. It also put Denver on the map where it wasn't on the map before. What are you cooking up now? I can't tell you. Well well, you're part of uh, Hickenlooper's <laughs> inauguration plans. and Yeah, I'm part of the transition team mm -hmm. and the chair, co-chair of the inauguration. That's keeping me busy right now. So you're happy. I'm very happy. You're glad yeah. you're not on the list. I'm glad to be off the list, yes. No kidding. One piece of advice you want to pass along. Everything is a possibility in your life to young kids, to adults, people give up too easy. They didn't get the job they want, they give up. They didn't get this that they want, they give up. Um, you know, I had a, an interesting road uh, along the way. Um, I grew up on the other side of the tracks as we would refer to the west side. Um, all those things were positive. So take the things that don't happen to you as a positive and then figure out from there. But don't give up. Keep focused. Thank you, Steve Farber, for being on Vista well, TV you, Denver. Thank you, Stephanie. God bless you. You too. All right. I just